Good afternoon to everyone here and welcome back to the conference. Um, for those of you who have been here already since, since morning or afternoon. Uh, my name is Michael Amo. I am from the Center of African Studies at SOAS and it's my privilege to chair this panel on China in Africa, more than business. As I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, there's been a growing interest in China's influence in Africa or China's interest in Africa. Um, the role of China towards Africa has become an alternative to um, the traditional Western influence. And that in itself generates a lot of interest across the globe. And that essentially also generates a lot of interest for policymakers, for researchers, for academics, and for the whole world at large. Um, and China has been playing this role for probably, maybe at the very least, two decades now in such a way, especially in terms of providing foreign direct investment, in terms of funding loans, etc., to governments. So the state-to-state -state interaction between China and African states has been quite intense. And that in itself, as I said, has sort of generated an interest because it, it's an alternative um, source to the Western paradigm, as it were. And what we realized actually is that for most of it, it has been sort of direct state-to-state -state interaction between the government of China and African states, as it were, um, usually in the form of foreign direct direct investment in terms of perhaps maybe heavy infrastructure, usually heavy transport infrastructure, bridges, roads, rural networks, etc. Uh, very much development oriented. Um, or if it has to do with oil prospecting um, and the money to begin oil prospecting and oil concessions, uh, it's all very much heavy investment from the Chinese side. And what is interesting with this particular panel that we're going to be having this afternoon in the next um, hour or so, is that it's not going to be so much, or it's not so much the state-to-state -state interaction between the Chinese government and African governments, or actually between Chinese government departments and other government departments in, in respective African countries. It's not so much of that, and it's not so much into the heavy investment into infrastructure, but what actually captures the concept or theme of this particular panel is we're going to be looking at um, individual Chinese migrants, private sector migrants, individual Chinese migrants who have moved out of China to other African countries um, with or without the state blessing as it were, who have gone into African countries whether to live there or to stay there or to invest. And precisely how the affair on the ground in this regard. And in this particular instance, we've got three quite eminent scholars who have done very good research in this kind of area. Uh, first of all, we've got, I mean, in the order of the way they're going to be speaking, we've got Isaac Odum, who is a PhD candidate from the University of Alberta. He's going to be talking about resistance as agency in Ghana, China relations. We've also got Hannah Postel, who's from the Center for Global Development based in Washington, DC, who is also going to be talking about China, China in Africa, insights from Zambian immigration data. And we've also got Li Jiang, who's actually a PhD candidate in the International Relations Department, who has co-authored her paper with Professor Chris Alden, also from the same department, and Angela Harden. Um, now, what is interesting for the selection of these papers <coughs> is that in the first paper by Isaac Kudim, well, essentially, the background, the way it is, is that there is some kind of legislative vacuum um, in terms of, as I said before, that there's been 
heavy state-to-state -state interactions. Um, but after that, in terms of the personal or private Chinese migrant motivation to go and do something in Africa, uh, because of the background of how China has been helpful to Africa, um, how African citizens in their respective countries view the Chinese as helpful developers who have come to assist in the development. Um, when the Chinese investment has remained or where they finished off and gone, uh, the African citizen sees the Chinese immigrant as a very helpful individual who has come to assist. But then we also have Chinese who actually migrate to African countries legally or illegally for their own private motive to go and establish business or to go and live there for whatever reason. And there is a legislative vacuum in terms of how much regulation framework exists to capture any eventuality in terms of what they get up to where they are. So that is also going to be addressed by the Godim's paper. But on top of all that, um, we actually find that it's very rare for any state in Africa, and, and perhaps anywhere else for that matter, for the state to have a handle on exactly how many Chinese are actually in the country, uh, because it's not always that uh, immigration data will capture everyone, or actually that how they came in, whether they came in as consultants or, or in whatever capacity, and how they remain after their project is over, um, and, and, and all that. Um, so there is also a kind of, there is no authoritative um, data when it comes to the figures. And Hannah Postel has actually blazed the trail in doing some research in Zambia where she encountered, you know, if you, when the rubber hits the road in terms of actually finding out how many Chinese people are in Zambia and the interaction with government departments or other um, organizations or institutions or other researchers or individuals about how to really get a hold of just how many Chinese are within, um, that also captures all that. And then, of course, we have um, Liu Jian's paper, which looks more about case studies in terms of what um, China is actually going doing in other countries in terms of um, agricultural development, in terms of sustainable development, and how that goes from there. So we have a kind of a three-pronged approach to exploring precisely how the ordinary individual Chinese migrants would go and fare in another African country with or without the state's assistance and exactly how the groundwork exists for them to operate. And so that's why we've got the panel here um, to address these areas. Um, and at this juncture, could I invite Isaac Kudim to come to the lectern? <laughs> Thank you, uh, Professor Amo, and thanks to the organizers of the LSC Africa Summit for uh, having us today. As he said, uh, my name is Isaac, and I'm a PhD candidate in political science. What I'll be doing today is to uh, share with you some of my findings in one of the case studies that uh, I used for my PhD dissertation and uh, to generate some uh, questions or, or uh, discussion about uh, Africa-China relations. So, but I want to focus specifically on one theme which, in my view, uh, until recently has been missing from the discussion uh, on uh, Africa-China relations. I tend to talk about it as Africa-China relations, not China-Africa relations, and, I, and I'll show you why I'm doing that. Uh, I think there's a difference. So what I'll do today is to, I'll basically start by giving a brief background to what I think has been said on the, the question of Africa-China relations and what is, in my view, missing in the narrative, and then uh, really 
try to think about the issue of African agency uh, in interaction with, with China, as in the Chinese government, and, and, and the Chinese, as in uh, individual actors and other private uh, enterprises. And then I'll focus a bit on the case study that really uh, helps me to conceptualize the question or the issue of African agency. And then uh, I'll offer some concluding remarks which should set the stage for other presentations and, and discussions. No topic of Africa's relations with the external, uh, the outside world has generated more controversy, at least since the end of the Cold War, than Africa's relations with China. And some of the discussions in the media, but also in the, even in the academic literature, uh, has focused, mostly focused on what China or the Chinese are doing or not doing in Africa and what the implications are for Africa's uh, development and for the international community. And of course, uh, there are those who talk about Africa-China relationship in terms of the fact that it is uh, some sort of a blessing. So it's like most of those people are very optimistic about Chinese engagement. And then there are those who are very, uh, what someone has called pessimistic about any possible uh, outcome of the engagement. I've just put on, on here, uh, these are not, they put the, they don't necessarily have to be one way or the other, but uh, Dr. Moyo's work tend to suggest that uh, China offers the opportunity for mutual uh, development or co-development co as the Chinese call it. And then we have those who talk about the Chinese exploitation uh, in Africa, and of course there are those who also uh, try to talk about the engagement in terms of uh, the fact that really uh, what's going on is not, uh, or the impact that China has on Africa is not any different from how Western countries have been. So some of these scholars, like the one in the middle, uh, Professor Brontegam has focused on uh, really uh, busting some of the myth that comes with Chinese investment in Africa. So, so there, are, there are, what I'm trying to suggest is that there are competing or contending perspectives on, on China-Africa relations. Now the problem with this kinds of characterization of Africa-China relationship is that the focus is on, the chi on China. While that is a good thing because we get to know what Chinese objectives and, and Chinese practices are, what that is missing is the Af other side of the engagement, right? And so recently there have been some works that are coming out which one of them is uncovering Africa's agency and there are those who are seeking to reinsert Africa's agency in the engagement and some of us are talking about locating African agency uh, in Africa-China relationship. And I think this is very important because a focus just on what the Chinese or China is doing in Africa is takes away or in fact repeats that old view that Africans are passive when it comes to their engagement with uh, not just the Chinese but other external actors. And I think, uh, I think that that is an illusion that needs to be unpacked, that needs to be challenged. And part of, that is part, uh, part of what I'm doing is to, is to push or to, to rethink that view. And I'm just, uh, this is sort of building on what other uh, scholars have done. Now, when we talk about African agency, what are we referring to? There are some people that have worked on this and focused on the agency of elite, African elite or policymakers or, or African leaders in terms of their engagement and negotiations with the Chinese. That is producing a lot of insight in terms of how, for example, Angolan elites are trying to use their uh, <coughs> engagement with the Chinese to hold on to power and to maintain their legitimacy. But of course, there are other forms of agency that lies below the state or beyond state elite. And that's what I want to focus on. But when we talk about African agency, what does it, what does it look like, right? What, when we say agency, what are we referring to? Are we referring to the fact that, well, the, China, the Africans are able to sort of sign a contract or a negotiation or a deal with the, with the Chinese and that's what agency is all about? Of course, agency 
really talks about the, the ability to exercise some, some, some form of freedom of action in terms of engagement to other people or other actors. But then, you cannot talk about agency, as, at least in my view, without talking about the structure or the possibility of the agency being expressed within some sort of constraint. And that's very important because some people think that when we talk about African agency, really, the Chinese are dominating, and so where's the agency that we talk about? But you, it does not, my view is that you can talk about agency and still uh, talk about agency even if the agency is expressed in tight corners, right? So that's very important. And, and of course, uh, the form of agency comes in different forms and, and, and with different actors or different agents. And so what I'm focusing on today is one tool of agency, which is resistance. And the case study that I want to focus on is uh, some of the things that have happened over the last couple of years in Ghana's interaction with, with China. And I want to particularly focus on Chinese miner, miners who uh, have been engaged in Ghana's mining sector uh, and, and what, the, or what the, the responses have been, or especially from the Ghanaian side. So, until recently, uh, we really didn't know about Chinese miners being involved, and I'm talking about small-scale mining, being involved in, in uh, mining uh, in, in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. But uh, in this case, what happened was that you have a particular uh, province or a particular a city in, in, in China where, which used to be a mining community, you have thousands of them migrating to the Ashanti region in, in Ghana, not just the Ashanti, but other regions, and basically become involved in uh, small-scale mining activity. Interestingly, small-scale mining activity in Ghana, by law, is reserved for only Ghanaians. So, if you are a foreigner you have to, and you are interested in the mining sector, you have to uh, register or, or come as a, uh, within the uh, large-scale mining, right? So um, this was a very interesting issue because we are foreigners who are now engaged in a small-scale mining. And it's what really caught my attention. And so my interview suggests that most of these uh, miners came into the sector or uh, the small-scale mining sector, which is popularly called Galamse in the Ghanaian context. Um, and they were, they were only successful because, number one, of the loopholes within the, uh, the legal and the regulatory framework in the Ghanaian context. And so they, they took advantage of that and settled, and, and they worked with some uh, Ghanaians. And so that's, this is the other thing that uh, there's, there was some sort of collaboration between Ghanaian uh, partners and the Chinese who got access to this land. But the problem is, that's okay because it really is not a big deal, the problem is what happened when the Chinese got involved in the Galamsey operations in Ghana, in the small-scale mining operations. What happened was that the small-scale mining is really, typically has been a, a, a group of people who just use uh, uh, pickaxe and, and, and shovel and dig the land and, 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 and get what they can get out of it. But the Chinese introduced some form of uh, mechanized way of digging the land for uh, the gold. They were using bulldozers, which was something that is really preserved for the large-scale mining. So <coughs> what we saw was this <coughs> devastation that was being caused to not just farm line, farmlands, but also to uh, river bodies, right? So here you have cocoa uh, trees that have been, because the land, the land is cleared to be able to dig for the gold, you have cocoa seed, which is Ghana's, uh, Ghana is the number, the, uh, number two uh, cocoa producing country, which is, this, this, is now, this has now become firewood. And the farmland, the farmland has been, or most of this farmland have been destroyed or they are not uh, uh, reclaimed after the, um, after the activities by the Chinese miners. I put the illegal in court because, uh, in, 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 in that context because whereas the foreigners cannot really be engaged in that sector, what happened was that the, some Ghanaians will now get, will, because they don't have the funds or they, have, they don't have the money, they would partner with the Chinese to get uh, 
access to the concessions. Now here is what, uh, what, what I found. So on the one hand, we have those who are benefiting from the Chinese activities or the mining activities or working with them. And then there are those who are not so happy, <laughs> more largely uh, the larger community. And so over a number of months, they, are, they were really not happy trying to get the police to come in, but nothing was happening. So what they got, the people did was to said no more, that they could no longer take the devastation that the activities of the Chinese managed were having on their community, social harmony, they were having on, on, on the economy because the Chinese don't really buy from the Ghanaian market. They come with their own, uh, they, they come with their own, oh, sorry. <laughs> they come with their own sort of uh, uh, stuff. Now, the other thing, the other dimension is that uh, they also, because of the impact on the environment, the river bodies or the, the source of river or the source of water where the, the people get their water from was also blocked or they were destroyed. So what happened was that these people were not, this community, these two communities that I, I went to were not getting access to the waters that they used to have. And so there was a protest, which basically was they marched and the youth spontaneously gathered, marched onto the uh, the venue or where the Chinese were, and it became a big scene, right? Because the Chinese also fired shotguns to deter the Ghanaians from coming to their, uh, to their land, and so there was that. But then what is important to me uh, and for this research is that this saying no more and protesting the, the activities of the Chinese is what got the attention of the government because for a long time the government was not really uh, doing much to prevent that. So they, the, the people went against the Chinese and that's what uh, uh, really became a national issue because it was a big, uh, it was covered by the media and everything. Now, that aspect, of course some people think about this as mainly anti-Chinese sentiment about people who are affected by the appearance of Chinese, but it's mo much more than that. What happened after the people revolted or protested was the government forming a tax force to basically uh, get rid of all the Chinese that were involved in that particular location. And so thousands of them were actually deported uh, back to China. Interestingly, uh, most of these people, the Chinese that came in, were coming from a particular uh, city or a particular county uh, in China. So the people started this protest without necessarily the support from the government because they were waiting for it and it wasn't coming. The community revolt and the subsequent action by the government to form a tax force in order to really uh, deal with the Chinese or the influx of Chinese miners and the reclaiming of some of the lands came as a big relief to some of the community members. Of course, at least the natural resources that were being destroyed or being looted, and the disturbance that it was having on the community uh, uh, was reduced. Now, does it mean that everything else, every, every problem associated with the Chinese presence in Ghana, or at least uh, in that context, is over? I think that's not the case. For the Chinese managed to be able to actually have access to the land concessions <laughs> speaks to the weaknesses within the, uh, the legal and the regulatory framework within the Ghanaian context, because there was no way they were supposed to get access. In fact, some of them actually were, were mining without having valid uh, work permit, right? But this, this was also the case because of the lack of attention that has over the years been, not been paid, or lack of attention that the government has uh, really uh, not paid much attention to the question of small-scale mining. The focus has always been on the uh, large-scale mining, and so that, has, that was a problem. So the marginalization of people who are in those communities is what led to the partnership that they had with the Chinese to be able to do this. But of course, forming a tax force um, to get rid of the Chinese does not fix the broader problem of the small-scale mining industry in Ghana. So these are some of the uh, challenges that come within that. Now, in conclusion, what I want to highlight is this. Now, 
you may consider this as just an episode in Ghana-China relations and really uh, how is this a form of, uh, of agency and what kind of lessons that we can learn from this. Based on, on some of the findings of this research, what you can actually understand is that, and which, has, which is really what I want to emphasize, is that if we want to talk about the impact that China or Chinese, either foreign direct investment or trade or whatever it is, would have in, in Africa, of course, my view is that it would depend on which African community, which African society, which African state that we are referring to. If there are laws that are well elaborated and in fact they are enforced, it is difficult for the Chinese to flout all those laws. Of course, in some cases, there is coordinated response to some of the activities of the Chinese. But the most important thing is that the impact that Chinese actors would have in Africa, whether on, on the economy or on politics or whatever it is, has a lot to do with the amount of space that African actors are willing to give to the Chinese, which is why the question, in my view, should no longer be about what the Chinese are doing or not doing in Africa. The question really should be about how the, Chinese, uh, how the Africans are engaging the Chinese, so that if there are elements of things that they are, they are doing which affect negatively some of the communities, or even at the government level, my view is that the blame should, most of the blame should go to the African policymakers or, or the civil society that are not voicing out those concerns. Because you cannot expect, for example, on the political side, you cannot expect the Chinese uh, to export any form of liberal democracy to Africa. Forget that. They don't, they, we don't even, anyway. But <laughs> they don't have it, so don't expect it for them, for them to transplant it somewhere, somehow. But even on the economic side, you cannot, and this just doesn't go for China, it goes for all the other <coughs> for external actors. You cannot expect an external actor to engage in your country or in a certain sector in your country in such a way that it would be beneficial to you just like that. You would have to engage uh, those actors in your own interest. And this particular case uh, really, in my view, highlight the question of African agenda. This is just one of my case studies. There are other cases that I look at how the Ghanaian government uh, uh, is able to, in some cases, negotiate with the Chinese for their own benefit. And, uh, but this particular case looks at, uh, looks at how individual actors uh, come together to resist what they consider to be problematic for their own security, economic security, environmental security. And that, to me, is very important that we need to be paying attention to some of those voices instead of just focusing on what the Chinese uh, or their dominant, the Chinese dominance in engagement uh, in uh, African spaces. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for coming, um, and thanks to everyone who helped organize and my fellow panelists. Um, today we're gonna, or I'm gonna take this conversation a little bit um, wonkier and lay out a bit of a framework for how to think quantitatively about um, the Chinese presence in Africa, as that's not really something that's been um, done to date. So the title of my presentation is Moving Beyond China and Africa, um, in quotes insights from Zambian immigration data. And I um, did this field work through a Fulbright Fellowship um, where I spent a year in Zambia. So just a quick outline just so we know um, what we're getting into. So the first section entitled Chinese Empire question mark quantitative consideration sort of looks at um, Chinese migration patterns to Africa that we've been seeing um, and starts to look at a little bit how we might assess these trends in a more um, quantitative light. Um, second, I'm going to lay out a framework for how I worked with some primary data um, to estimate the size of the Chinese population in Zambia. And lastly, how we can use this quantitative data to quantify some common claims and trends that a lot of really solid qualitative work has um, set out in this field. So that includes typologies of Chinese migration um, to the continent, um, diversity of these flows, um, localization, so how much Chinese companies have been hiring um, local 
African employees as opposed to bringing in people from China and assimilation. So first section, um, my, the prior two speakers kindly laid out sort of a background of the increasing um, Chinese presence in Africa for me, so I'm sort of gonna skip over that a little bit. Um, I will just say that a lot of the work that's been done to date focuses mainly on Chinese trade and investment flows and much less on the people that are accompanying these movements of um, goods and capital. So my main interest is to look much more at who are these people who are accompanying these flows of money and goods? What are they doing in Africa? Why are they there? Um, and just understanding a bit more about who they are so that we can better understand how to engage with them in future and make better and more sustainable policy. So just couching Chinese immigration to Africa sort of in a broader context, um, we're seeing in general the population of Chinese overseas um, grew from 4.1 million to 9.3 million um, over the course of about 20 years. So that's you know, quite a large increase. And so it's really important when we're talking about um, the increase in Chinese populations in Africa to understand that this is actually part of a larger global trend. To that, I would add that there, starting in the 1980s um, through the 2000s, there were a number of liberalizations to emigration law in China, so allowing people to leave where they may not have been before. They had a series of passport reforms and also some liberalization linked to China's um, World Trade Organization bid um, in the early 2000s. So these laws all enabled it to be much easier for Chinese citizens broadly writ to leave China and therefore move to new communities abroad. Um, the going out policy in 1999 was targeted at um, mainly large Chinese um, state-owned companies who were looking at investing overseas, um, offered them a lot of um, uh, sort of packages to make investing overseas a bit more um, attractive. So this led to a lot of companies going where they hadn't before um, through these incentive schemes. And a lot of these incentives were offered sort of in concert with African governments who were looking um, to um, provide some contracts mainly for infrastructure investment, at least as we've heard. Um, and I would just also add that in addition to sort of the increasing population broadly writ of Chinese overseas, a lot of communities have arisen in your quote, resource frontiers, which include Africa, but also um, elsewhere in the world, such as in South America. Um, so that Chinese immigration to Africa is couched in sort of a broader context, which I think is often sort of left out of this discussion. So we've all, heard about the quote Chinese empire in Africa, the number that's most frequently tossed around is about one million migrants across the continent, which actually considering an enormous continent of many, many billions of people, um, a million is really not that large of a number, um, but it tends to spark a lot of fears about sort of the Chinese neo-colonialism um, in Africa. So. First, uh, I would just say that the presence is largely overstated, um, mainly because there have not to date been any good numbers to estimate um, the actual size of these populations, as we see here. Um, and this is not only problematic in an academic sense, but it's also extremely problematic because it's um, led to a lot of problems that we've seen happening on the ground. So xenophobic elections, um, violence, outbreaks of violence, for people who are concerned um, about this growing presence um, in their homeland and a lot of just general misunderstandings. So to me, I find it extremely important to better, on their side, better understand the size of this trend so we can better um, understand how to engage with these um, growing populations. So some quantitative considerations to keep in mind sort of more broadly. This is definitely a very, um, imperfect and fraught exercise, but I believe that that does, is not a good reason for it not to be done, so I'll just sort of take you through some of these um, considerations when doing an exercise of this type. The first is that migration data is notoriously elusive. Um, everywhere in the world, it's very hard to sort of track people where they are. Um, temporary stays, entry and exit, it's very hard to develop a reliable estimate of how many people are in a place at a given time. Um, more specifically to Africa, though also true elsewhere, um, there's sort of a lack of statistical infrastructure, just um, statistical offices across the continent are very underfunded, often don't have the capacity to really undertake um, data collection of this scale for really 
lots of different statistical variables, and especially this is exacerbated um, when we come to migration data. Also, defining um, the Chinese overseas has often been sort of a tricky exercise as it's sort of a broad concept that a lot of people um, may self-define as Chinese overseas but not receive the official designation um, and vice versa. So for the sake of my research, I focused on uh, people <coughs> who were registered with Chinese nationality entered Zambia on a Chinese passport and sort of left it um, as simple as that for this exercise. So um, Morton Jervin has done a lot of great work sort of on um, interpreting and improving statistics in Africa more broadly. He's focused a lot <coughs> more on sort of the economic growth and um, GDP literature, but I found um, this quotation to be quite instructive for the exercise that I was trying to undertake as well. So he said that the scholarly literature has either neglected the issue of data quality and therefore accepted the data at face value or dismissed the data as unreliable and therefore irrelevant. So I think this is sort of a false dichotomy that I think we have a lot of potential to improve on with some really um, good work um, in local context. I think it's possible to improve upon um, these two extremes. So this is sort of just an overview of the exercise I undertook to try to understand um, different aspects of the Chinese community in Zambia. So here's a photo of a page of um, employment permits um, as tracked by the Zambian Department of Immigration. So I was lucky enough to be granted access um, to Zambian Department of Immigration um, per employment permits for two years. So I manually transcribed about 25 to 30,000 of these permits um, into Excel, which <laughs> was quite an undertaking, um, but provided really a wealth of information that hasn't been seen before, not only um, for the country of origin, but also on um, the companies that are hiring these people, often locations that they're residing within Zambia, so you can get a sense of residence patterns and country, um, and also occasionally occupation or job title, which lends us some insight into what positions and what roles are these um, Chinese migrants playing once they arrive in Zambia. So, some considerations. So, I think one of the best things about being so sort of ingrained. I spent months just sitting in the Department of Immigration offices sort of talking to them about all of the considerations that go into their data. You learn a lot of things about how things are processed and tracked that may not be um, immediately evident. And so I was sort of able to collate um, some sense of how to best, um, how to best work with the raw data I was receiving. So there are a number of um, considerations that would produce sort of a downward bias in this sort of estimate. Um, first being the census data, which most, I'll say, that most international organizations, when they're talking about migration data, they just pull the census data straight from the national statistics offices. In this case, um, the Chinese were severely undercounted in the most recent census because according to Zambian census procedures, they exclude everyone who lives in, quote, institutional housing which is any sort of group structure. So since most Chinese um, migrants come to Zambia to work on large infrastructure projects or work in mines, et cetera, most of them do actually live in group housing sort of on their work sites. So simply by definition, the census excludes this entire um, section of the population. Um, exits are notoriously undercounted. It's very hard, I mean, everywhere in the world, it's really hard to keep track of people leaving places. Like if you think about, um, the next time you leave the UK, they might track you in the computer, or they're supposed to track you in the computer, but often um, when those systems are sort of less strongly in place, it's very hard to keep track of who's actually leaving a place once they've arrived. Um, in Zambia, um, when you receive a permit, uh, especially a work permit, um, you're allowed to bring your family members in with you, but they come in with you on that single permit. So I would be granted a permit, and if, if I had a child, they would also come in on the same one. So it's impossible to tell by the granting of one permit how many people are actually entering. So through a lot of sort of qualitative surveys, um, et cetera, I sort of determined a high and low bound of perhaps um, what is about average for the number of people um, accompanying a typical migrant. Um, renewals also are counted as new permits, so we have to sort of keep um, track of who might be leaving after their normal um, employment permit time of two years as opposed to renewing their permits. Um, and then also, 
Um, the exit records that I mentioned before, although they are poor, they also count non-migrants. So someone coming in you know, for a two-week business day, we're not sure when they exit, if they're actually part of a more permanent community or <coughs> if sort of circulating back and forth, which is also sort of a broader issue in this debate. And then just two quick upward bias things. So like I was saying before, sort of exits count circular trips. So someone could be resident in Zambia, leave for two weeks and come back. But we wouldn't have any way to disaggregate that across the data. And also visa overstays. I think it's fairly common for people to come in on your um, two-year employment permit and stay beyond that in, in a regular status. And there's no way to sort of, to, to, through the data, um, keep track of that number of people. So through this, it was also really helpful to have done a lot of qualitative work to sort of back up and inform um, the estimate. So here we go. I hope you can sort of see it. Um, from the left to the right, I started um, with the base numbers as provided and sort of each column corrects for one set of bias. So I sort of resolve the undercount first, which then yields a maximum value of about 23,000. Um, so as you'll see right off the bat, um, 23,000 is much, much lower than a lot of the numbers that have been circulated specifically for Zambia, um, which usually fall in the order of about 100,000 to 200,000. So I mean, it's about a tenth of that figure. So that's really important to realize. And this is at an absolute, like an absolute improbable maximum. Um, and then resolving for some overcounts, we get down to a most plausible figure of about 13,000. And it's important to keep in mind that this community is highly fluid. There's a lot of people who come in and out um, for shorter or longer term stays. Um, and so it's sort of impossible to assess a firm stock of people resigning. Um, but I think that at any one time, this is a, it's a um, good sort of uh, estimate at the time of the population size there. So about 13,000 is where I end up. Um, most estimates are higher than that. Some qualitative researchers who've done good studies in Zambia have also reached a number of about that type. So it's sort of reassuring that though imperfect, this method sort of yielded um, sort of a quite a common sense estimate on that front. So then I think it's just really interesting, besides the total population size as a whole, it's really interesting to look at some of the claims and trends that commonly float around in this space and see how they check out um, with these permit figures themselves. So first, just looking at typologies of Chinese migrants, I think um, there is a number of groups that are generally ascribed to be the most common types of Chinese migration um, to Africa, the largest normally being labor migrants, often temporary labor migrants for stays of about two years, working with large um, state-owned companies often. There's a growing class of um, newly arrived entrepreneurs um, who we also see in this data. Um, I think diplomats are sort of another class. And then some people um, hypothesize that there's a group of transit migrants who come to Zambia or elsewhere in Africa first. Um, due to relative ease of entry um, as compared to Europe or other destinations and then move onwards. So, so um, the permit data largely supports these hypotheses. So in Zambia over these two years, about 95% of all the Chinese entering on longer term immigration permits were labor migrants. So entered on an employer permit with an established company. So the employers break down um, like this. So all of the companies, um, all of the private companies were all Chinese owned, which is sort of an interesting trend. There were no um, Zambian companies or Indian companies um, employing Chinese migrants. Um, about 55% of these companies were national or regional state owned enterprises, which again sort of checks out with our assessment that a lot of Chinese migrants have been coming to work on um, large infrastructure projects, um, natural resource projects, et cetera. Um, apart from these private companies then, about 20% of the Chinese labor migrants entering Zambia um, were employed by a Zambian government ministry, which sort of points out the importance of um, government contracts to these streams. And when you compare one year to the next, so I had 2012 and 2013, in one year, there are about 600 um, migrants who came in to work um, for actually the uh, Ministry of Defense, 
they were building their new Air Force barracks um, just outside of Lusaka. Um, and the next year, you see only about 30 Chinese um, brought in under that same employer. So that shows that that single contract was responsible for that huge inflow of people. So you'll probably see both a large difference year to year, and it demonstrates how important um, these government projects are um, to these flows of people. Um, you also, in the 2012 data set, it listed um, occupation title for migrants coming in, which is really interesting. So you can see actually what people were coming in to do and what sector of the economy were they gonna be engaging and sort of what sphere or sector of um, seniority as well. <coughs> so about 20, I just did sort of a rough coding in my data set of management positions, et cetera. So um, about 25% um, of Chinese coming in um, came in in a management position, and actually 35% of total people coming in in management positions were Chinese, so slightly overrepresented in that regard. Um, however, there are also some more vague and possibly unskilled positions that Chinese migrants were occupying, which has been one of sort of the, the major contentions in this space that um, Chinese companies employ Chinese nationals even when there are locals that could do the job just as well, that the Chinese migrants don't possess any certain skills, any specific skills. So for example, um, most of the large state-owned companies employed multiple Chinese chefs for the same company, which is not something we see um, companies of other nationalities doing. And about 20% of the total um, of Chinese labor migrants coming in um, had the title of, quote, constructor or, quote, skilled worker, which is not to confirm this allegation in any way, but just to say that um, they, these titles were left quite vague on purpose since a lot of them were also quite specific. So it just, I think it suggests that there could be more done work done in this area to really sort of tease out this claim. So I'm running out of time, but um, the data also sort of gives some insight into a couple of these other trends. So I think um, the first being diversity is that the typical Chinese migrant was a 20 to 30 something year old male from the east coast um, of China coming on short term permits to work. And I think we're starting to see a lot more diversity in these types of flows. Not only um, more women than you would think, but people from um, interior provinces in China, um, which is directly linked with this um, labor migrant flow. Often wherever the company was based in China who's operating in Africa, they bring people from their local hometown with them. So that sort of accounts for this geographic diversity. And I think diversity is also really important, um, as Michael alluded to in his introduction, that uh, the Chinese and Africa relationship is not Chinese state to African state. There are a lot of individuals coming from various places with various different motivations who engage differently with their African host countries and have different aspirations and different goals while they're there as well. So it's very important to understand this as not one single narrative, but rather a mixture of various individual narratives. Um, localization, just quickly, there is evidence um, more than is commonly accepted that Chinese um, employers hire a lot of locals. There have started to be a lot more programs in terms of training, et cetera, locally. Um, to train local workforces so that not as many people have to be brought in from China. And also in terms of assimilation, it's just really important to note that the Chinese sort of fall in the middle of migration trends um, in Zambia at least. There's a lot of high income migrants from the UK, the US who come in to work um, either in large international organizations, charities, etc. And they fall very much on one side of the spectrum, the commonly thought of expats. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we see a lot of irregular migrants from Somalia, from Zimbabwe, who occupy a very different swath of society. And I think the Chinese sort of fall in this middle space um, in Zambia, at least. A lot of people weren't quite sure what to make of them because they might stay a little bit longer than your traditional expat, but also often um, don't self-segregate as much or um, you know, tend to work and live in some contexts more on a peer-to-peer -peer level um, with a lot of um, Zambian natives at least. So I think this will be an important trend to monitor moving forward, that this is more of a south-south flow than we're um, maybe used to seeing um, and sort of defies some of the stereotypes um, that we might have ascribed to it. So thank you so much. Happy to answer any questions later.
Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm presenting on behalf of my colleagues, Professor Chris uh, Alden from LSE and um, Angela Harding and Ward Ansu, both from the University of Pretoria. On our joint research on Chinese agriculture technology demonstration centers in Africa, which is one of the most important forms of Chinese contemporary aid on the continent. The People's Republic of China started to establish diplomatic relations with African states since the Bandung Conference in 1955, and agricultural aid was among the earliest engagement of the PRC in Africa, which can be dated back to the late 1950s. From then on, Chinese agricultural aid has undergone roughly three phases. First, the earlier period during 1960s to 70s, which is primarily driven by the political considerations and featuring a large number of state farms built by the Chinese in Africa. Then is the transition period from 1980s to 90s, which in line with China's um, domestic economic reforms started to put more emphasis on the aid performance and also started to serve not only dipl diplomatic but also economic objectives. And finally, the current period under the FORCAC uh, framework that is Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, which have greatly encouraged the development of the um, relations between China and Af Africa since <coughs> the new millennium. At the current stage, Chinese agricultural aid in Africa has taken a variety of forms, such as expert dispatch, agriculture exchange and training programs, and multi-cooperation with international organizations, and agricultural infrastructure building and materials dimension. And particularly important is the, the flagship project of Agriculture Technology Demonstration Center, or ATDC, which is also our focus of research. The ATDC project was first proposed in um, 2006 on the <coughs> third um, the third forecast, the Chinese government pledged to build 10 ATDCs in different African countries. The number was then increased to 20 in, in 2009. By 2012, there were at least 23 Chinese ATDCs across Africa, with 14 of them having already been transferred to the local government. And the ATDC project is worth investigation, not only because of the importance at, and the high profile attached to it by the Chinese government, <coughs> but also that it is a key institutional expression of the transformation of Chinese agricultural aid in Africa. As will be detailed later, the ATDC project combines both diplomatic and commercial objectives, involves a diversity of public and private actors, and adopts a rather complicated operational um, mechanism. Also, it represents an innovative dimension of Chinese agricultural aid in Africa in that it is a hybrid of the different forms of aid programming previously used, such as the state farms, the agricultural technology extension stations, and the agricultural expert dispatch, etc. And more importantly, some of the mechanisms of the ATDC were intentionally designed to avoid problems experienced before. According to the official document issued by Chinese Ministry of Commerce and Ministry of Agriculture. The purposes of the ATDCs are explained as to serve China's foreign strategy and promote bilateral relations with the recipient countries, to help increase grain production, improve agricultural technology, and enhance food security of the recipient countries, to provide a platform for Chinese companies <coughs> to develop agribusiness in Africa, and thus promote China's agriculture going out policy. And lastly, to build the ATDC into a base of agricultural um, technology experiment and research, demonstration and extension, human resources, training and, di and display. And the last few aspects, namely the um, uh, research, demonstration, training and the display, are also termed by the Chinese government as public interest functions of the ATDC, for they are, support, they are all supposed to be non-commercial activities. And to put it in another way, 
And these objectives of the ATDC can be seen as threefold. First and foremost, the ATDCs were launched for diplomatic reasons. The aim was to improve the food security of the recipient countries through the transfer of Chinese advanced agricultural technology and thereby to consolidate and strengthen the bilateral relationship between China and Africa. Second, ATDC also bears some commercial element, which is mostly um, manifested through the intention of using the ATDC as a platform to facilitate agribusiness or agri um, agricultural investment for Chinese companies. And this aspect is termed as business introduction in our research. The last dimension concerns the sustainable development of the ATDC project. The sustainability issue derives from China's decades-long experience of agricultural aid in Africa, as has been widely observed by practitioners and scholars. Almost all <coughs> Chinese agricultural aid projects in the past cannot escape the cycle that no matter how successful the initial phase of the project proved to be, once the Chinese experts left, the object would soon fall into um, disrepair. Quite often, the reason for this was attributed to the lack of uh, capability of the re aid recipient countries, particularly in financial, um, managerial, and technical terms, to run the project independently without any external assistance. At this Again, against this background, the sustainability issue was brought to the fore in the designing process of the ATDCs. The emphasis on that can be seen from the performance evaluation system of the ATDC, in which the planning and realization of sustainability um, of the ATDC occupies 45% of the total scores, more than any other indicators. As to the actors involved in the project, on the Chinese side, the government incorporates Chinese companies, both state-owned and private, in the management of ATDC. This demonstrates an element of government company cooperation, and in the case of private firms, a public-private partnership model. The Ministry of Commerce and Ministry of Agriculture at the central level are in charge of planning and facilitating the ATDC. In most of the case, each of the ATDC recipient country is also twinned with one specific province in China, thereby the corresponding provincial government of China also play a very important role. And notably important is their role in encouraging and supporting the agriculture companies from their own provinces to invest in the twinned agriculture, uh, African countries. And on the recipient side, at the moment, mostly is government agency uh, are incorporated. No private actor are currently included. And each ATDC has three operational stages, the project con construction stage and technical cooperation stage and business operation stage. The project construction stage normally takes one to two years with full funding from the Chinese government. Then follows a three-year technical cooperation stage when the public interest functions are going to be implemented. And this, this stage is also funded by the Chinese government. What is important is the final business operation stage. We're also in line with the business introduction objective, the primary purpose of having this prolonged period of cooperation is to ensure the sustainability sustainable development of the ATDC to address the unsustainability problem as experienced in the past. The Chinese government devised a plan to incorporate um, company actors and in the middle, med medium and long term to run the ATDC as a business. Um, it, it is ex expected that financially by developing a <coughs> market oriented production based on the ATDC, the profits earned could be uh, used to finance the daily operation of the center, including the realization of the public interest functions. In addition, the existence of the Chinese company and the Chinese agriculture experts would help maintain the managerial and technical sustainability. To, investi to investigate it, how, how the ATDCs are implemented on the ground, 
um, we went to the field and research on two APDCs in Mozambique and South Africa, respectively, over the period between April 2013 and January 2015. The APDC in Mozambique focused more on crop farming and animal husbandry. And the APDC in South Africa focused on freshwater aquaculture. During our site visit and interviews with different stakeholders, we paid special attention to the three aspects I emphasized earlier, namely the technology transfer, business introduction, and sustainable development. <coughs> Based on our field research, we found that first, um, the technology transfer through APDCs proved to be beneficial to the local communities in the host countries. The training courses were carefully designed by the Chinese experts according to the specific needs and actual, ab actual abilities of the different types of trainees, such as the smallholder farmers, the technicians, and the officials. And the partic participation of the local partners have helped overcome the language barrier and therefore improve the effect of the technology transfer. From the feedback perspective, the farmer trainees, for instance, confirmed that the Chinese agro techniques were useful and helped increase the output, sometimes more than doubled, as seen in both the cases of Mozambique and South Africa. However, the impact <coughs> of the technology transfer were also to some extent limited, mainly for three reasons. The first problem is the training model. In both cases, the majority of the trainees were the smallholder farmers. It was so because the Chinese experts believed that by transferring farming techniques to the actual agricultural producers, it would have the most direct uh, result. And this is, this is at least true and sensible. However, we also found that the potential benefit could have been much increased if um, the demonstration and training activities of APDC had been connected to the local, um, to the country's agriculture technology extension system in a more effective way. The fact that the South African ATDC trained a few local agriculture extension officers who turned out to have played a rather, a very positive role in helping disseminate the Chinese technologies confirmed our point, and the ATDC in Mozambique, however, hadn't seemed to be linked to the country's extension system in any meaningful way. Another problem concerns the post-training application. Even if the, uh, the, trans the technology transfer per se is successful, it may not necessarily change the livelihood of the farmers unless they have the enabling environment whereby they can put the techniques into application. In South Africa, for instance, the heating system on the, on the farmers' fish farms, which were fundamental to the application of the techniques the farmers learned from the ATDC, were left broken for months, causing stunted growth of the fish and reduced profits. In Mozambique, um, although we didn't manage to interview um, the trainee farmers of the ATDC because they were scattered all around the country, we went and visited and research on a Chinese agro-investment project which involved systematic technical training to the local farmers. As revealed by this case, the techniques taught by the Chinese expert could not be implemented outside the Chinese farm in the farmers' own homes due to the lack of tools and irrigation equipment. Um, and this is not uncommon to, to the majority of the Mozambique and smallholder farmers. And a potential challenge also lies in the different farming cultures. It takes time for the African smallholder farmers to learn and also get used to the Chinese or Asian way of intensive cultivation. And it is also difficult, often difficult for them to stick to it, um, which is more technically demanding and time consuming compared to <coughs> extensive way of farming, which they are used to, which they are more familiar with. This therefore um, cast doubts on the sustainable effect of the um, transfer of Chinese technology. 
And in terms of the business introduction, um, both APDCs in Mozambique and South Africa had started or planned to start market-oriented production activities. More essentially, both of the two Chinese companies involved had either set up separate agribusiness or have been actively seeking investment opportunities opportunities by using the ATDC as a springboard. Indeed, available data suggests that at least eight out of the 14 first ATDCs in Africa have already successfully established their independent agribusiness outside the centers. Furthermore, the <coughs> Mozambican case has demonstrated a greater role of the ATDC as a business platform in that it also provides information and technical support to other Chinese companies and individuals, therefore facilitating their agro-investment in Mozambique. The project, the project sustainability, however, seems to remain as a big concern within the renewed aid structure, as shown in the Mozambican case. Although the ATDC did make some business attempts, the center was still not able to achieve financial independence sim simply by selling the agro-products. This is pr primarily due to the limited land capital and human resources um, it possesses, and also, and therefore, a rather small production scale. Um, indeed, most of the ATDCs are facing the similar constraints. Therefore, it, it seems not very likely that ATDC will be able to sustain themselves financially through business operation. To pursue that, an expansion of investment or production is necessary, which, however, may face challenges at least on two fronts. First, how likely is this bolt on investment to be successful? The question then is translated to the profitability of conducting agribusiness in Africa. According to the existing and potential Chinese agro investors in Mozambique, the difficulties in operating in Africa were far beyond their expectations before they, they came to the continent. And none of the existing investors had managed to make any profit after years of operation. This may cast some doubts on the perspective of ATDC's commercial development in the future. Second, even if the company is able to make good profit, to what extent will the companies use that profit to finance the public interest um, functions of the center. Given the fact that there hadn't been any concrete agreement between the Chinese <coughs> government and companies which clearly specify each other's rights and obligations, it is rather unrealistic to expect company actors to willingly and automatically to fulfill the general um, public interest functions of the ATDCs. In terms of managerial and technical sustainability, well, the immediate danger of project failure does seem to be reduced with the continuing stay of the Chinese team. Potential problems are still visible. For instance, the, the lack of effective participation of the local partners in the daily management of ATDC, compounded by the typical Chinese dominated structure of, man of management, generates the risk of leaving the local partner incapable of operating the centers independently. Technical, technical, technically, the overwhelmingly farmer center of trading model also makes it less likely for the local agrotechnicians to conduct the extension of Chinese farming techniques on their own. To sum up, we found that the problem mentioned above um, can be largely explained from two aspects. First, from a policy design point of view, well, the multi-objectives of the ATDC naturally call for more detailed um, action plan. <coughs> the, the existing policy is very unspecific. Um, for example, the business operation stage, which was supposed to be the most innovative part mm -hmm. of the ATDC pro project, has been full of ambiguities and uncertainties. Apart from that, full consideration of local conditions an adequate feasibility study seems to be lacking in some instance, in some instant instances. Also, the government company cooperation model remains largely unstructured. Second, bilateral interactions between the Chinese government company actors and their African counterparts seem to be ineffective. 
the detachment of the technology transfer from the host countries broader extension system has something to do with the lack of communication between the two sides. The sustainability problem can also be partially attributed to the lack of adequate participation of the local actors in the daily operation, as well as the deficiency of a joint comfort, um, joint efforts before the two governments in making plans for the ATDC's future development. Um, in light of this, we found We thought several things could be done in the future in order to improve the ATDC performance. First, the Chinese government may need to work out a more detailed and feasible action plan, plan for the ATDC's business operation stage. Second, a more solid arrangement as to the government company cooperation model needs to be initiated with a view to institutionalizing the, company, the company's obligation in delivering government aid projects as well as the supportive measures that are meant to be taken by the government. And last, although all through the planning and implementation of the ATDC, the Chinese government should encourage a more active participation of their local African counterparts and make concrete measures to facilitate a gradual change from a Chinese-dominated do management model to a more cooperative or localized man management model. In short, through our investigation of ATDC project, we've seen that the Chinese government has made a real effort trying to um, realize its pledges of supporting agriculture, agricu African agriculture, and also trying to improve the aid performances. However, much still needs to be done in order to achieve a true win-win scenario as proclaimed by the Chinese government. Thank you. Hello. Well, thank you very much for your, your attention. Um, and thank you, speakers, for your illuminating presentations. It's now time for the audience to engage um, the discussions. And could you say who you are and where you are from, please? Um, gentlemen of the front. Thank you. My name is Julius Ayoktabe from Nigeria. Can I just say that we have very limited time left, so if you can be very brief, we are going to have one to round off questions. Yes. Um, <coughs> Hannah said, I mean, if we look at the statistics she showed us, if China was an African country, it would be the 36th of the 54 nations. So that is very symbolic. Um, there's an African proverb that says that if there's no enemy within, the enemy outside can do you no harm. Isaac, I want you to tell us, what would you advise the African Union to do in this relationship with China? And that is for the governments, which we know will never be applied. Um, Chair, would you tell us what you would suggest the African youth, especially engaging with social media, what can we also do to highlight the, the troubles <coughs> and the successes? And even Lou's story, which almost looked like a success, at the end, we saw that it created more problems than it solved. Uh, Kenneth, <coughs> Kenneth King from the University of Edinburgh. Um, I was um, interested in uh, Michael's presentation. The, um, we heard about what happened in the partnership between uh, Chinese and Ghanaians. We, we heard one side of what happened to the partnership, that the Chinese who had got partnered with Ghanaians uh, to develop mining were kicked out. Uh, not presumably because of the resistance of their partners who are Ghanaian. I wonder what happened to the Ghanaian partners when there was resistance by the other Ghanaians whose uh, rivers and uh, cocos, cocoa farms had. Second, um, I was very pleased to hear from Hannah that um, it's the first time I've seen, heard a really careful analysis of Chinese migration into uh, a particular African country. And the first time that I've had anyone talking about Chinese migration without talking about how a great proportion of them are, are uh, uh, prisoners from China. Mm -hmm. uh, so congratulations. The third uh, is that a great deal of the Chinese collaboration with Africa is done with partnerships. For example, many of you know of the Confucius Institutes, 
46 of them in Africa. They're all done through partnership between, say, my old university in Nairobi and Tianjin Normal University in China. Is one of the problems with the ATPT is that it wasn't clear who were the Chinese partners to maintain this. The Ministry of Agriculture wouldn't do very well in that. So maybe the absence of places like the Nanjing Agricultural University uh, and others like that would be some of the problems. Um, Cinderella, my question is, what do you make of China's presence and massive, you know, explosion as you presented in the continent vis-a-vis -vis the Western countries? Because China claims it has its own principles of win-win kind of partnerships with the continent, and they look at themselves as doing business with the continent and not what the Western countries do. What do you make of it? All right, thank you for uh, those questions. I think I will start with the question on, on the African Union, what position. H here is what, what's going on. You have uh, China, or in this case, Chinese government, engaging African, African countries bilaterally, but also multilaterally, right, of course. Uh, and then, one of the questions that has been there for a long time is that, of course, since 2006, China has what we call the China-Africa policy, and of course, it's even been updated uh, recently. <coughs> and, then, and then there has been the question of where is Africa's China policy, right? My view is that in some instances, it may not be workable to have a continent-wide policy to engage China, because China engages bilaterally in ways that sometimes differ from how uh, it engages other countries. For example, the way China or Chinese companies, especially backed by the state, work in Angola when it comes to the tr by res I mean, uh, commodity back uh, infrastructure, for example, is a little bit different from how it works in Ethiopia or in Ghana. So my sense is that while we can talk about broader principles that can guide African countries' engagement with China, it may be difficult to have a continent-wide policy because in some cases, the labor issues in Ghana may not be the same kind of labor issues that uh, China, China, may, or China, China may be facing in South Africa. So, th so there's some, some sort of nuance that can, can only be taken care of in that respect. But there's every role that African Union can play in terms of laying out some of the broader principles uh, on that, that's, that's my view. Uh, on the question of um, uh, those who have, who have been able to do some sort of collaboration uh, with the Chinese and those who have uh, resisted, here is the, this is really, in my view, symbolic of the impact China has uh, or Chinese companies or Chinese actors who have in Africa. It depends on what's, what's going on. So we have, in this, in my case study, we have those who are benefiting because of their partnership with the Chinese, right? And of course, there are those who are not really, uh, who are on the other side because they are not benefiting uh, directly, like I said. You, you may think that when the Chinese are engaged in a the, in the particular mining community, they contribute to the economy. Right, because they buy from the, but in this particular context, they don't. They don't buy from there. They have food in their land, in their tracks, in their uh, uh, field where they mine. So, so the ripple effect or the is very limited. But of course, if there is no cocoa or there is no cassava or there is no farm product on the market because of the destruction to the farmland, that affects everybody in that village, right? So. Much as though some people will benefit, of course, I didn't talk about the role of chiefs and other officials who are the Minerals Commission and those kinds of things. They are all involved in this. But it tells you that there are some people who would take advantage of the uh, Chinese presence to get something out of it. And then there are, of course, the wider society or some people who also neg negatively be affected. Especially when we talk about the traders, right? Traders are, co are claiming that the Chinese are, are not, uh, are, are competing competing them out of the market because of cheap Chinese products. 
But ordinary people, that's what they can afford, right? So there's that sort of uh, complex dynamics and uh, that comes to the fore when you talk about uh, China's engagement. The last question about um, China versus Western countries. One of the discovery, <coughs> one of my, uh, uh, I, I don't know the discovery, but whatever it is. I, I found out in the Ghanaian context, I was trying to figure out that what account for Ghana's increasing engagement with the Chinese, right? What account for the economics? Because China is almost all the key infrastructure in terms of the energy sector is being, is being taken, or is being financed by Chinese uh, uh, companies. So m my interest was what is going on? Uh, what is accounting for that? And part of the, my findings basically suggest that what the Ghanaian policymakers are doing is not so much about uh, cutting ties with Western government. They are not doing that. What they are doing is, uh, the argument is that the, the Chinese option gives them some form of leverage. Because one of my case studies, is, for example, the Bui Line project that, I've been, that, that is already now running. This is the hydro project which did not get funding from the World Bank. Right? And the Ghanaian went ahead to, 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 to so, sort of get the Chinese to be able to finance this. So uh, if the World Bank would not sponsor it because of environmental assessment report, which was going to be very devastating to the national park, the Chinese will, be, will sponsor it or will be interested in sponsoring it because it has other benefit to their companies and to the Chinese themselves. So my view is that uh, really, whether it is China or the West or Europe or any other country, uh, the key is whether the Africans are getting a good deal out of that any sort of uh, transaction with the Chinese. So the approach may be different, the actors may be different, but it could be the exploitation could be there if the Africans are, are themselves not taking responsibility to engage the Chinese uh, on, on the I would just add on to that. I would agree with a lot of aspects of that assessment and also say that um, I think the issue of agency is really important partially because I think, not necessarily broadly right, but I think um, countries in the West got very used to African countries not having agency when they came to the bargaining table and those sorts of deals, and now there's another actor in the room and it's sort of sh shaking up the equation. Um, I'll just put that out there. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with what Professor um, King suggested that the, some problems on the Chinese side in terms of the partnership. But to me, the problem is more about there are too many actors on the Chinese side. The central gov on the central level, they have the Ministry of Agriculture and Ministry of Commerce, and on the provincial level, they also have these two system uh, actors. And then they have the, com the companies and sometimes the universities and sometimes uh, research institutes. So I just found these too many actors create the problem of communication and also just lower down the effectiveness, lower down the effectiveness of the project. Well, could I use my um, privilege here close to the speakers to ask one very practical brief question to all three. Um, Lu Jian, first of all, if, well, the aquaculture, um, they're producing, the ATBs are producing fish farms uh, and rice. Um, if the ordinary South African diet that returns towards Chinese restaurants, how do you foresee the ATBCs being sustainable in the long term in South Africa, for example? And to Hannah, if the figures really don't, if the Zambian government got the figures absolutely right, would that change anything? And Isaac, briefly, precisely what must the Ghanaian government do in terms of the policy space <coughs> to make it more practical for both sides to be able to do anything positive in the long term for the Okay. Um, in the case of South Africa and the, the cooperation field of agriculture was divided upon the negotiation between the two sides and there was some preliminary um, the way on the local market because there was a new trend of eating freshwater, uh, freshwater fishes in South Africa and there was a market and so there shouldn't be a problem for the ATBC to sustain in this regard and also I think the ATBC 
it's not fixed on only on that uh, only on that area. <coughs> it's also it's um, keeping contact with the South African government and also the local uh, businessmen to see what the potential um, cooperation area could be in the future. Um, short answer is yes. Um, I think that if numbers were gotten right and made public, um, being an important aspect of it, it would make a huge difference. Um, Zambia is a really interesting case because the former president, Michael Sata, um, the first time he ran for president, ran on a um, highly anti-Chinese platform fueled by his claims of hundreds of thousands of Chinese literally infesting Zambia um, instead of investing. Um, so I think in that case, if people were aware of the actual numbers, um, those sorts of claims are much more difficult to make. <coughs> yeah, so for a long time, African policy makers have been talking about the fact that policy conditionalities from the IMF and the World Bank impact their autonomy and has its effect on their sovereignty and things like that. If we were to take the approach that the Chinese have, in terms of their engagement, well, you don't have those kinds of <coughs> political, uh, exactly political or governance restrictions on your, on, on any any of the uh, any of the uh, investment or assistance. So now you have the space. You can no longer you can no longer uh, make the argument that the Chinese are limiting your your ability to determine which policy or which one works for you, right? And so that's why I think that uh, in, the, the, in the Ghanaian context, there has to be an understanding that the only way you, you cannot have, for example, a law that is not biting or a law that is not, a regulation that is not working, the only way you can ensure that corporations, either Chinese or Western corporations, are <coughs> abiding by investment regulations in your county is by enforcing it. And you can only enforce it when you have the capacity to do so. And of course, in some cases, the capacity is there. It's just that in some context, because of politics, for example, because if you suck or get rid of all the Chinese in the mining sector, it may affect your chances of getting some more funding from the Chinese. If that is a calculation, then already you have weakened your negotiation ability to be able to do anything when it comes to your engagement with the Chinese. So African policymakers, including the pressure from civil society, that's what will make this work. We have to recognize that um, their relationship with, with, with China, or on economics or whatever it is, has to be driven by their own uh, policy agendas. Well, on that note, shall we give the speakers a round of applause?